the nice introduction. And um, thanks everybody for for tuning in. Um, I, I hope uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting building to work on for the last while, and I hope it makes for an interesting presentation. So, um, just by way of introduction, as more than Paul. So uh, my name is Seamus Doyle, and I'm associate with uh, O'Connor Sutton Cronin. I've been working on the EXO building since the mid 2016. So at that point, it had just been granted planning permission. Um, and I've been responsible, I suppose, for delivery of the design, tendering and, and the delivery on site then uh, in terms of construction information from, from then until now. Um, it's been a very challenging project. Um, it's, it's taken uh, its fair share of resource. We've had a team of about seven or eight people uh, just on the structural side alone um, at various points over the last couple of or the last four years. So we've uh, that includes our, our head modelers, Paul Devine and, and Michael Jarchek and um, Cormac Woods was involved during the, the planning stage as well. So we've had some very senior staff uh, spending a lot of time on this because of its complexity. Um, and not to mention as well, our, our drafting team were even that was challenging. So that was headed up by Bree Power. Um, so as with all projects of this scale, we have um, we have a large design team as well. So um, on here. Um, we have this is a I suppose a collection of everybody involved from the design and construction teams. And um, just to, to mention a few, we have um, Shay Cleary Architect. It was Shay and his team who had the original vision of the building. Um, and I suppose that was the, the, the starting point for the project. They, they won a, a design competition for the building and uh, brought the project from true planning and into tender stage. So it was at that point then they teamed up with uh, <clears throat> Brian Murphy and his team at MC Arch Architects to bring the project through the next stages, which uh, in this case were a guaranteed maximum price uh, tendering process and then true construction on site. Um, Bennett Construction were awarded the contract uh, to uh, as, as the main contractor to deliver it on site. And I suppose the, the other one of the other big players then of course was Shimalai are the steel fabricators and we'll, we'll have a brief uh, word about them later on. So, um, for anyone who's not familiar, this is uh, this is the project on the screen. So this was taken about um, maybe three or four months ago. Now at this stage, it was just uh, towards the completion of the the steel frame. So it's a, it's a it's a seventeen story building. Uh, you can see the northern tower element there, um, and then towards the front of the picture, we've got the nine story element, which uh, is it houses a, a roof garden on the about thousand square meter roof garden on the top. So it provides overall about 16,000 square meters of office space, which will house about just under 2,000 workers. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather striking design, as Paul mentioned. It's, um, it's, it's certainly quite uh, noticeable. So the, I suppose there, there were two main functions to the design. The first was the inspiration it gets from, from the Dublin Docklands, which it's right on the doorstep of. So the, the next, the next um, property to the, to the east is the Dublin Docks itself. So <clears throat> this this was a, a particular driving factor in the aesthetics of the building, and you'll see as we, as we move forward the the impact that the adjacent tree arena has uh, as well. So we can see um, on the screen here, you can see the gantry the gantry cranes, which are are visible from the top of the exo there, um, and and are quite similar in in their exposed industrial steelwork. The the blue color obviously is is quite a a pointer. So that was the I suppose the starting point for. The aesthetics of, of Shea's design. Um, for anyone not familiar then we have just a, a quick map of Dublin um, and over on the right hand side we have our exo location so this is the <clears throat> effectively the, the last frontier of the city where it's where the city meets the, the Docklands so um, this here is a just a, a satellite view so we've got the the tree arena here <clears throat> we've got the district center here which is the the Gibson Hotel and the, and the Point Village uh, whole uh, compound is here so th this strip of land just to the east of, of the tree arena is, is where we're constructing the exo and then right along here that, that wall there forms the boundary of, of dublin's docks so our dublin's docklands and we've obviously got the liffey here to the south so we'll um we'll just rotate that to, to keep everybody with their bearings and um, to match in with the uh project drawings and mm. um, so again, you, you, just to get your bearings, you got your your tree arena. Uh, the the Point Lewis station is just here. We uh, that has an impact as well. So we've got the Gibson Hot, uh, the Gibson Hotel, and the, the Point Village as well. So, um, I suppose the the first part here, uh, we want to just talk about the site constraints. So uh, aside from the building being 
quite complex. And um, Bennett's were, uh, <clears throat> were, 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 suppose, presented with an extremely complex um, site, which had many, many constraints um, and, and would have been difficult to build a standard building here, to be fair. So we, we'll just have a brief word on that. And what's on the screen right now is the, is the footprint of the EXO building at first floor level. Um, that, as you may have seen from the picture before, uh, it, it tails off at first floor and there's a much reduced ground floor footprint, which is what's highlighted in blue now. So it effectively makes up the three elliptical cores which, which come to ground. Um, and the, the squared off ends are just the entrance foyers. So that that reduction alone, it's it's typically just over 2,000 square meters for, for the first floor and above. And our footprint on the ground is about 860 square meters. So that's the that, that represents about a 60% reduction in floor area, which is quite significant. Um, and it forms the basis of the of the second major design criteria, which was the permeability and the, the public publicly accessible nature of the of the the plaza around the tree arena so it's one of dublin's few uh, publicly open plazas like this that that um that are available so dcc were very keen that that was kept um, and it was you know you have your various events and there's christmas markets and whatever else are held there so they wanted to keep that kind of aspect to the area um, and secondly, and, and certainly uh, not least, the, the tree arena use it during queuing and during major events. And there's there can be quite a, a large crowding in those areas um, at various points in the year. So <clears throat> the, the idea of the tree cores provided a lot of room between the buildings. So it was effectively three smaller um, pavilions almost at ground floor, um, which allowed a lot of uh, pedestrian movement around them. And then you still were able to accommodate the, the, the rather large um, office block above. Um, just to the north, then we have uh, the glass box. So th this this doesn't really form part of today's presentation, but it's worth mentioning. It's a not insignificant 10 meter high single story commercial unit. So it's a, it's a steel building, which very much ties in with the aesthetics of the uh, of the EXO building, so that that just forms part of our project. But um, it's the last we'll we'll get to we'll have time to mention today. Um, along the so you can see the the red line boundary. Um, again, that that kind of encapsulates the the plaza area which we were tasked with. Um, at the, the the guys are relaying it at the moment. So that that's. I suppose our legal site boundary in in one sense, but um certainly we didn't have access to all of that for for any portion of the build, and um, it was just the area of responsibility that we had, and um, and one immediate kind of impact on that was a, a planned CPO from DCC uh, to facilitate the East Wall Road widening works, so that was uh, a planning condition that we needed to uh, that we needed to comply with, sorry, um, and it essentially meant that we couldn't have any permanent. Um, services, attenuation tanks, or anything of, of the like within that zone. So it was effectively an area within our current site that we needed to remain sterile so that uh, DCC could come along and um, take that as part of our future work. So that, that was kind of due to happen in tandem with the EXO, um, but it's it's fallen behind just a little bit. So it hasn't just yet, but it's still been uh, considered in the design, certainly. Um, to the north, then, we have the, the district centre, which we mentioned. So that was an OCFC project back in the mid-2000s. Um, and it was completed circa 2007 or thereabouts and includes the Gibson Hotel. So that's that's a, a rather large block, a rather large development. Um, it has offices, hotel, shopping centre, cinema, etc. And also has a three-storey uh, basement to provide car parking uh, below it. So um, that, that takes up effectively one block of, of the North Docklands. It's, it's surrounded on roads on all sides. So um, the next stage of that project was going to be what was known as the Watchtower. So that was a 30 story residential block. It was uh, dubbed as Ireland's first skyscraper. Um, the guys had managed to construct a three story basement, which the outline of which is highlighted in pink on the screen. Um, and they uh, managed to get to minus three, minus two and minus one. And as they were coming up to ground floor level um, in the late 2007, early 2008, the recession um, hit with its full force. So. Um, Construction work uh, unfortunately ceased on that and it was left for a couple of months before people realised that it obviously wasn't going to go away anytime soon. So they, they essentially they cast a, a ground floor slab to cap it off, tarred over it and, and left it there. And it's been lying there unused ever since. So you've got this sort of three-storey basement facility that um, uh, hadn't been utilised just yet. So 
as part of our exo works we we were to take that existing basement refurbish it to to suit our needs um, somewhat and to effectively relay it out to to make sure that we had the correct provisions for the exo building and um, access to that basement then was provided through a new single story basement under the north tower um, and that was to tie in with the with the existing pink area shown on the screen the next item or the next constraint i suppose um is as part of our rework or our refurbishment works with the basement and um, we needed to strip off that ground floor slab because it was it was only temporary in nature in the first place but secondly another planning condition we had was the extension or the future extension of the red line so at some point in the future it's it's proposed that the red line will be extended to the east and um, as, as you can see on the screen there now directly over our existing basement and it'll swing south and across the Liffey over towards Pool Beg. And um, so while we were designing the new ground floor slab, we had to accommodate effectively a trench within that so that uh, at some point in the future when the, when Lewis was constructed, the um, we, we, we weren't um, sterilizing the zone below for track foundations and services and so on that's um, common on the Lewis. Uh, the next item there that just the, the site boundary in brown so you can see while we while we did have responsibility i suppose for the red line boundary the bennett's had only access to the to within the brown hoarding line so it, it's quite clear there that by by the time you've considered the footprints of the new basement and the cores and the existing basement they had very very little to to work with so they they had quite a challenge there to manage their site activities while progressing with the construction because they were almost on top of, of the areas they were building at the time. The, um, the the requirement for the tree arena to have access through the permanent EXO building wasn't in any way relaxed because we were now constructing the EXO building. So one uh, particularly unusual feature um, that we had to accommodate uh, from very early on and um, throughout tender as well uh, was to facilitate the tree arena's requirement for emergency access through the site so effectively they use this area here for um queuing and for emergency access or sorry emergency exit in the event of a fire or, or any other emergency so the idea that 14 to 15 thousand people could come out here in a in a rush meant that uh, with, with some crowd management uh, analysis carried out by Michael Slattery is that you, you simply you couldn't get the uh, number of people out of here in time. So these orange areas here are effectively corridors that were built within the hoarding and that Bennett's had to, to hand over to the tree arena during uh, the evening of full house events. So um, the tree arena has has many many events and they have them almost every day during their their sort of festival season so uh, at say four o'clock um every day bennett's had to clean down their uh, another part of their already quite small site make sure it was swept out make sure it was safe access it would be handed over to the tree arena who would man the gates um, and then it, they would be in control obviously if there was anything if there was an emergency or anything they they would be able to open the gates and, and let the crowd dissipate so um obviously an extremely unusual um, requirement for public access through your site um, but it was something that was captured early on and it's something that Bennett's um, did a, a very good job I suppose in liaising with the tree arena because they had very uh, you know changing requirements different size audiences and, and different times you had matinees um, which would be earlier in the day and um, so it was look it was a, it was a tricky area and it got to the it was um, such an important topic that I suppose the at the weekly or the bi week the fortnightly DTMs, we had tree arena events um, listed in the minutes, which is again an unusual site. So, um, the last thing then is the corridors we call it, the the, the area between the exo hoarding and the tree arena. Um, Bennett's used that as set down, as delivery, etc. During the day, and again that had to be handed back over as part of the the standard handover of the uh, escape corridors here. So that was a again that they had there was a lot of um, extra work you know you'd have you'd have your um, deliveries here and your stockpiling and you have to move them out every evening so that was that was just another facet to the to the challenge so if you look you can see a picture of the um the site from the north so this is taken from the balcony of the gibson hotel um, in the forefront of the photograph then you have um the basement has the most of the ground floor slab of the basement has been removed you can see the guys are nibbling back down 
to the basement minus one slab. So that was where we decided to, to demolish two. And then we would, we're, we're treading here. You can see we've treaded some new columns down to base minus three level to, to suit the new layouts. Um, and then we would build back up with our trench to accommodate the Lewis track. Um, the single story basement here, you can see the cheap pile wall has gone in. So that that you can see the top of an excavator there. It's a single story, but um, it, it you know by the time the excavation was done, it was almost two and a half stories. By the time you included for a two meter deep foundation and and lift pits and so on, so that's that's a significant excavation, um, albeit not very big on plan. Um, you can then see the central core, um, further back. So the jump form for the for the stair core is just starting there. And then you can see the, the escape corridor. You can actually see it there in the, in the background. And uh, there were two, um, can you see one? You can actually see the gate here for the second one. It hadn't been constructed yet. Uh, the idea was that one of them would always be available to um, the tree arena when they required it. So uh, you can see straight away, extremely tight site, very little space to maneuver. And uh, look, it's, it's, it was a tricky area for Bennett's to negotiate. Um, <clears throat> if we move on then to the building form so that I suppose the, this is a, a good um, description of how the whole, um, the various parts of the construction fit together. So you can see the existing three-story basement section here. We've got the glass box on top, which sits directly over the, the existing basement. So that had to be considered in the redesign as well. And um, we've got the single-story basement here. But again, you can see the foundations are quite low. And um, we've got the Lewis, which treads between the glass box and the Exo. So as part of our planning condition, we even have to consider pole locations and how we'd service the, the Lewis. So there was quite a lot of um, or discussion with TII about that. Um, and then the, the Exo building itself, you can see we've we've got some transfer trusses here at first floor to, to give that clear area. Um, and we, we've got these overhangs, both of which we'll, we'll look at in detail. Um, just a, a brief word then on Shimlai. So the, they're, uh, uh, the steel fabricator were brought on board by Bennett's. They are Italian-based company, and um, they're probably where well, they are one of the the top steel fabricators in Europe, certainly if not uh, further afield. They've projects all over um, the Americas, Europe, and and anywhere else you, you care to mention. So they have a huge expertise, and they they specialize in in complex um, as well as large projects. But they they do particularly specialize in complex projects, which the EXO certainly does um, fall into. Um, they've had two <clears throat> visits to Ireland previously. Um, the first is the um, the steelwork for the Slaney Harbour bridge crossing in my native Wexford. So, um, more recognisably, I'd reckon is the second project where they did the um, the roof truss for the Aviva Stadium. So the, everybody's probably aware of the the curved or faceted roof truss which which holds that up. So it's a you know t t particularly complex project um, in in Ireland's uh, cityscape. So it was certainly up the street to to have a look at at the Exo building. So. We'll um we'll have a look at this in in a bit more detail now. So um, the exo building is obviously primarily a steel frame, and um, the first thing that will probably jump out is the large um exo truss or the external truss, which you can see you've got the the main verticals and diagonals straight in front of you. And um, so the the structural I suppose load path is that the internal floor plates are steel beams supporting a composite uh, concrete deck. Um, the internal spans range anywhere between 9 and 18 metres with some local 20 metre spans. So they're, they're, they range from sort of standard to, to quite long. Um, they are supported entirely by the external truss. So the external truss is structural. It's not a, a, just an aesthetic or for show. It is it's very much a structural, uh, plays a structural function within the building. Um, the, the external truss itself is supported at three locations, which are uh, match in with the three core locations. So you can actually see towards the front of the frame there, you can see a, a diagonal column or the mega column as we call them. And um, so you've three of those and it's it's mirrored on the far side of the building. So you've got this um, symmetry there. The uh, structure or the cores then are concrete and rectangular in plan, generally speaking. But when they pop out below the first floor level, which you can see here, um, that most of the building line stops as we saw earlier so the the concrete uh, cores become drum or elliptical cores um, at that point as an architectural feature um, and they're supported on concrete foundations which have been piled uh, into the ground we're obviously we're in 
uh, Dublin Stocklands, which are primarily reclaimed ground. So we've got about four metres of made ground and then um, black boulder clay below. So <clears throat> another item that you might notice is the steel frame is 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 complete in this photo and there's very little um in the way of sad on the building so that that wasn't and um, that was by uh, that was part of the plan so that we'll, we'll discuss why that was later as well so i think we'll, we'll move on to the exo truss so i'll just highlight it here and um, this effectively there's two exo trusses one on each side they're approximately 600 tons each and um, they're located external to the facade so um it's it's very much an exoskeleton and and that's the i suppose the the the, the inspiration for the name of the building the exo building is is based on that um design philosophy so um as you can imagine there were plenty of challenges we we rarely keep our structure outside the facade line and um, you've got some obvious ones such as thermal and, and weathering details and then non so obvious ones such as tolerances um and uh, I suppose deflection is, is another big one. So you're, you're trying to marry uh, two things that, that generally uh, you would allow a lot of tolerance between. And, and when you are passing one through the other, you, you take away a lot of the flexibility that it might otherwise have. So if you look at the um, an architectural elevation, you can see that the exotrus is, is a lot more pronounced because this particular drawing has the uh, facade shown. So because of the dimensions of the the truss it's effectively 15 stories high and and about 110 meters long so it's it's more a series of hangers and struts than than i suppose a traditional truss but um it's very much um it's very much still a, an external truss as such and um, it supported the three locations as i said so they they correspond with the internal cores um, and one of the well several three of the i suppose uh, primary issues we had were how we were going to design the truss at, a, at an early tender stage because we, we knew it wasn't something that could be allowed for with um i suppose uh, generic notes or, or just allowances we needed to actually get into the to the detail and to the design of it to make sure that we were able to um to allow bennett's or whoever it was at the time to, to price accordingly so we had that we had the issue of um connecting the various members at the at, at the structural junctions and then we had how we were going to construct or erect a steel frame uh, that needed 15 stories of structure and um, before it was able to hold itself up so that was obviously a, a huge design constraint so we started with the connections and uh, to see how, how do we physically put this together and uh, as as is i suppose common in in larger projects and and, and you'll see in, in many steel heavy projects such as stadia or whatever and um, the node design or nodes were used to uh, marry together several um, large elements coming in at different uh, angles or, or directions. So what we did was we we looked at ways of forming nodes to um, connect various members um, and they were able to then, they were very flexible, they were able to accommodate um, vertical, diagonal and horizontal members um, coming in at all different directions with, with relative um, ease I suppose and you can see that they vary in size and shape and um, the bottom left there is just is a fairly standard or there's very little in the way of typical but it's a typically sized node and um, the top pictures there shows some of the, the very early steel work going up so you can see the various nodes been landed in on top of the temporary towers which we had to include for um while the frame was being constructed and you can see as as you go down along you've got a different shaped node at each um grid line and then you've got another couple of pictures showing how um, Shimlai prepared or Tusker, who happened to be the frame erectors, how they prepared the nodes prior to landing in the, the main exotrust members. Um, they size-wise, then as as you went as you basically as you went towards the north core and towards the upper floors, you you tended to get slightly larger. So <clears throat> you can see. Um, the left hand picture there you can see at the eighth floor we have some significant significant size nodes um, and on the right hand side there you've got the diagonals they're semi um installed you can get, see the first of of two uh, parts of the diagonal are installed there so you've got each one of those is about 15 meters long the overall diagonal is about 30 meters long so it's you know it can be difficult sometimes to get the scale from from these photos and um, jumping over to those those nodes up on the eighth floor so that that central node is, is the largest node on the project. It effectively um, collates um, almost all of the northern tower, um, or at least half of one side, 
to to one point. So there's a huge um, huge force been collected at that point. And just to give you an idea of the scale there, um, you, you've got a. I've just put a little man in there, so it's it's about eight meters high. So it spans over two stories, um, and and look, it's a significant uh, single structural element. Um, sticking with that note, then in in terms of its design and its procurement, um, th this storyboard, I suppose, tells the the life cycle of a node. So on the top left, it, that's a direct uh, direct extract from our tender finite element pack uh, modeling that we did so we we built the various nodes and um, you can see the central uh photo on the top is is just is the analysis program so you can see we've got our, our stress peaks at the at the connections there and then the top right is a, an extract from our tender drawing and um, when shimalai came on board then they they went through a similar process a slightly different software but a, a, the same process and the their bottom left then is their version of the model node and they obviously made um some refinements we at that point we'd managed to uh, refine our own loadings and, and make sure that we had the, the correct loadings in um shimalai obviously cast their um contractors eye over it so they they knew what was easier to build or what was more efficient to build so they we, they certainly had plenty of uh, efficiencies to bring to the project on that front and um, um, once we'd agreed on the uh, sorry the, another point was the aesthetics of the nodes obviously Shea and, and MCA had and um, there was a, a big process whereby we went through what the nodes physically looked like to make sure that they sort of tied in with the with the overall aesthetic of the building so once all that was agreed we had our uh, the bottom left shows the, the node design that uh, Shimlai did and then that was put into their structural model here you can see in the center and then that's it procured and fabricated on site so you can see and um, there, there's a lot of similarities between the the tender stage uh, node and and the final node but um you know it's it's been refined slightly but it it it, it required that level of detail um at tender stage in order to effectively price it and, and make sure that we were making the correct allowances so the Exotrus, once it's it's standing, um, needs obviously its own support. So the Exotrus allowed the building to hang, um, and it allowed that large reduction at ground floor level of um of about sixty percent, as I mentioned. So, um, in order for that to to be supported, we needed to to pick it up. So, the three mega columns are located uh, in the center of each concrete core, um, they're full steel frames which are effectively buried within the concrete cores in the center so if we take an elevation of the south core it looks um it looks like this so th this is a, an extract from our revit model and um, and you can see we've we've got the the diagonal um column will be in compression we've got our main vertical column which comes down as part of the exotrust and it, it all ties in together um quite neatly obviously because we have such a large vertical compression force and then we kick in to, to, to bring it back within the building, that, uh, that, that load path allows for or creates a sort of a push-pull <clears throat> which occurs over the, the four stories which the, the, the column is diagonal. So um, that, was a, that was a huge um, design aspect that we had to look at very closely and um, obviously it was you know we we couldn't um we we couldn't uh do this design without considering this tension force the compression compression force here isn't quite so difficult but the tension certainly um but uh, and again the, these um mega columns were were effectively supporting uh, i would estimate probably 75 percent of the building load between the three of them so they were um uh, there was a vast amount of load being collected at those points so the, the mega columns themselves, they were put together in much the same way as the Exotrust using the node um, principles, I suppose. And um, so, just again to get the scale, um, we've we've got some components of the mega truss shown on the screen there now. So I, I've just numbered them and and referenced them back to the key plan there in the top right. And um, so again, you can see in the bottom right element tree there, you've got uh, plenty of construction workers crawling all over it, and and yet it only forms a small part of the um, overall elevation which you can see in the top right so um that particular element is, is one of the heavier uh, lifts on the project it was about 30 tons it was put in with a, a 350 ton crane so uh, a significant element uh, it to be put in in, in one lift um, and we've got a picture here on the left hand side you can see as it has been steered into to place um, and <clears throat> on the right hand side then we can see the the mega column as it came down into the building 
and into the core it we encapsulated it in concrete and that and that helped us to dissipate the load into the foundation so we're trying not to we're trying our best not to um create uh patches are very small areas of local high stress so that allowed some of the load to shed into the wall as it went down and then we had a joined base plate at the end a rather significant um joined base plate um and then i suppose that as as the as the diagonal member went out through the facade that occurs and um, because of the angle of it and the size of it that occurs over almost a full story height so at that location you have a penetration through the glass facade of almost a story height and um, so it's, it's a significant detailing um, area for for ourselves and for the architect so the mega columns themselves they have quite a i suppose a, a visual and impact on anyone the, the tenants um when they come on board so from First, second, and third, as the bit as the mega column begins to track outside, you can see uh, here on the left hand side, you can see all three of them there: the the south, the center, and north mega column. <clears throat> and they're quite prominent on the floor plate, so they're they're a feature of the building as much as, as any other part. And um, and then on the right hand side, just to give you an idea again of, of the sheer size, we've got a um that's my hand on the on the mega column so it's about it's 152 mil plate um which was used to create a, a, a plate girder for the column because we didn't have a, a standard section size large enough and that's designed to take about 50,000 kilonewtons of compression so <clears throat> quite a, a significant structural member certainly um, and then as part of our, our early sort of due diligence and and um just our own checking we were invited out to Shimalai's production plant in Italy so that's that's a, a member from each of the design team members, I suppose, my, myself front and center there. Um, so we, we were out early. Um, the mega columns, the first sections of the mega columns were arriving to site quite early because they had to be cast in with the concrete. So what's shown behind you there is one of the elements of the mega columns. And we went out to inspect the facilities, which were um, extremely impressive. They, they brought us around three factories um, just outside um, Venice in Northern Italy. So um, uh, extremely impressive facilities there by Shimlai and, and capabilities certainly. Um, so moving back to the to the tension force that we spoke about, <clears throat> we um this was an area which we engaged with on with Shimlai very early on. And um, it was an area of concern for Bennett's. Um, we had proposed at tender stage to cast in a, a steel member because we, we could we couldn't physically connect the steel member to the concrete and allow the concrete to take the tension in between because the, the forces were simply too high. So um, we proposed to, to embed or to cast in a, a steel member, but Bennett's, um, look, it, it didn't really work with their um, site construction plan. They wanted to jump form the cores. And obviously you can't have um, something sticking out to that effect um, as part of a jump form and obviously tolerances and so on came into play. So another difficulty that we had was that the the tie had to pass through effectively a lift core. So in the center there, you can see we've got a 450 RC wall, which is the thickened wall between the cores. It's not necessarily required structurally, but it was it was put there to um, to give it, I suppose, to put in a placeholder for structure, which we are a zone for structure, which we could then use to get our, our tie force through. And, and we ended up, we used um, almost every last millimeter of it. So um, that was a, another complicating factor we couldn't, uh, we had to uh, um, align the the ties with this lift core, and lift cores had to be aligned with the ties, both in tandem. But um, it really constrained the size of member we could have, and and our loadings were were really pushing us to the limit. So, the solution that we came up with, um, which Himalaya and, and they brought a, a huge amount of um expertise to the table on this particular connection. It was a particularly difficult one. Was um we've got an elevation here to the top of the page, and we've got a, a plan there on the bottom. So. Effectively, we have um, two large plates uh, which are clamped to the central wall. You'll see in the bottom right with the section there that we, we had recessed the 450 wall to uh, accommodate these plates. Um, the, they were then through bolted through the, the core wall to, to effectively tie them uh, laterally into the, to the overall stability system. Um, the idea was that the heads of the bolts and so on were all uh, contained within the overall width of the wall. Um, and that allowed lift uh, suppliers to, you know, they still had their clear area for the um, for further lifting equipment. 
um, it, it's quite difficult, obviously, if you start to protrude into there to um, to coordinate that with the lift supplier. So that they were the piece that brought us through the core, and then as we as we merged from each side of the core, we had to have a transition piece which would get our get us from two vertical plates back to a, a common H section uh, column section. So that was in order to we, we needed to make the, the section shallow and shallower in those locations to allow services to pass under and to um, support the metal deck which was out there and so on. So we needed this transition piece and then they were connected together using a simple pin connection. And we say simple uh, in theory, but not quite so in, in practice. So um, the, what I've shown you there is the center core. It's, it's the easiest to illustrate, but just in terms of the northern core, uh, where the loads were the highest, the, the blue plates were approximately 550 deep by about 50 mil thick, um, and they were grade S460. So we, we, again, we had to upgrade up the grade to keep our, our structural zone as, as minimal as possible. Um, the pin, which was also S460, was a uh, diameter 200 millimeters, and that was squeezed into a, a hole in the both the transition piece and the, and the plated piece of uh, 201 millimeters. So obviously the guys had a, a tricky time putting that together on site with, with their tolerances and, and look, they managed to do a very good job on it. Um, and that that tie on the Northern Tower has about 11,000 kilonewtons of tension it's designed for. So it's a significant force and it's not, it's not something we could have achieved via a concrete connection. So that's the drawing end of it. This is what that actually looks like on site. Um, so you can see the knuckle to the left hand side of the mega column as it turns. So this is the fourth floor um, and the third floor. So as it, as it reaches the fourth floor steelwork, it turns in um, and over the course of that story height, it, it goes from external to internal. Um, and then effectively, this is a hanger for the, for the lower couple of floors. Um, this is our tension tie for the uh, where, where it is a H section. You can see a rather significant node there, or a splice, sorry, there. Um, and then you can see the transition piece and the pin and the uh, plated um, or the plates that go in through the core. And the beauty of, of this connection was, well, it, it accommodated everybody's requirements, but it was also able to be put in with very, very little in the way of uh, concrete uh, intervention. So you can see we've got a very small slot there. We had the we had the, um, the the notch which needed to be accommodated as well, but it was it was much simpler than trying to uh, certainly trying to cast in maybe a, a steel beam or or many other the options that we had looked at so um again the zoomed in version you can see that the pin that's a, a capping plate on the pin it's not the actual pin itself but it's just behind and it's a it's a very impressive um connection and the only uh, the only pity about it is it's it's primarily covered in now with services and ceilings so um we, we have plenty of photos to to keep ourselves reminded but um that that covers the main structural support for the exotrus um so that the next design challenge certainly was the how, how do we get the, the floor plates are primarily supported by the exotrus so how do we get the load path from internal to external and the only way we can do that is by penetrating the facade so again that's that's something that we would generally try to avoid if possible but in this instance it wasn't it was a, a design feature so it was something we had to to consider very carefully as part of our design so We've penetrated the facade about just under 300 times um, on, on both uh, in total on both sides of the building. So of that, about 200 of, of the penetrations have a thermal break encapsulated within them because um, obviously the, the facade line doubles as the weathering line and the thermal line. So we, we needed to, to think about that quite carefully. Um, and then the remaining uh, penetrations go straight through. So that they were dealt with differently. We had to insulate them a, a lot more on the inside. So... Um, the connection that we have um, that we came up with is is shown on the screen. So it was effectively we we've two end plates and we've sandwiched in a, a fart plate in this instance between them for as a thermal break. So uh, in principle they're they're relatively straightforward. It's just two end plates. Um, but in design there there's a huge amount of of work that had to be done for uh, a variety of reasons which we look at now. Um, you can see that the thermal break there. It's just sandwiched in the middle. Um. And if you look at the beam side, which is is here on the ground before on the deck before they um, they uh, installed it, and um, the most of the inner internal part is is a, is a void, so that's all filled with the with the thermal break. So that's what gives you your um, your resistance to the cold uh, coming in, obviously. And the steel washers were put in for two purposes. Obviously, the the loadings were quite high, and um, so we needed a way of of getting through some real connection, and um, rather than relying on the fire plate in, in its totality. Uh, and secondly, 
and almost primarily uh, in the fire situation we found during our kind of um, our early design checks uh, that while it's easy to fire protect um, an element, uh, everything that or any any fire protection is usually based on the approximately 500 degree melting point of steel, give or take. Um, obviously, a fire plate, which is a, a piece of uh, plastic compound, melts at a much lower temperature than that. So while we could guarantee that it wouldn't go on fire, perhaps we couldn't guarantee that it wouldn't um, lose its structural in integrity. And so if it started to melt, we needed a way of the building keeping itself supported during the fire situation. And as an aside, actually, I see Farrader now um, uh, have, have a product on the market that maybe would overcome that, but it certainly wasn't uh, available at the time. Um, so if you look then at the uh, slightly later photograph of the, the frame erection, you can see the vertical members here. You've got your, your sort of cantilever stub, and, and all that is to do is to, to offset the connection so that it lands within the middle of the facade line, um, and therefore thermal break is in the correct position. So that that was obviously there was an awful lot of careful coordination, um, and that's some something where we needed to look at tolerances, uh, deflections, and uh, I suppose just logistically how do you fit that in? How do you get a, a panel back over it and and weather that up afterwards when you don't necessarily have access to the outside of the building? <clears throat> so there was a lot of design consider or construction considerations to take on board for, as part of that connection. Um, the design then you can see obviously the the vertical truss members. Um, are effectively columns. Um, one of the major design assumptions in our finite element um, modeling was that they were restrained laterally at each um, floor plate. So that was necessary because otherwise we would be designing a, a column which was effectively eight stories high and it would have become unfeasible. So um, <clears throat> the starting point for the design, I've included this uh, this sort of outtake on the left. This is a just a, a screen grab of, of my calculations from three years ago. Um, so uh, I've included it because it, it, it just to, to sort of reiterate that no matter how complex the the problem is or the design problem is, it's it's about you know it's about breaking it down into a, a smaller, more manageable um, design consideration. So um, this was drawn out just to understand that we had a, we had a major access moment here shown in the red uh, because of the standard uh, framing of of the of the steel beam which goes back into the building. So this was a welded connection, so it was fixed. So you had, uh, you know, you had your, your standard bending here, uh, which gave you a major axis moment. But the second uh, and less obvious one was the buckling moment. So as this column goes to buckle, um, it, it's going to buckle at the, at the floor plate. Um, if, and what that, that can induce then is a horizontal force, which gives you a minor axis moment. Um, so from a strength point of view, that's relatively simple to design for, but um, You'll find in the, the code goes through. Um, you know, you, you ask yourself what what is a lateral restraint to a column, and the code will tell you that it, it, look, it's just something that needs to um, restrain anywhere between one and two and a half percent of the vertical load applied in the horizontal direction. Um, but that isn't that that's primarily to do with a maybe a an edge beam which is is taking that load in axial compression, and therefore it's very stiff. Whereas you can see we were taking it in bending of a stub, which also had a bolted connection involved. So um, uh, there's a, a very good SCI publication, P360, which goes through what I suppose the what's considered restraint and so on. And they give some good guidance on, on the associated stiffness of a restraint and how stiff it needs to be before you can consider it a restraint. So what we had to do, we had to do a very detailed analysis of this connection to ensure that we were providing the lateral restraint to the external members um, that we had assumed in our, in our global design. So this was something that was taken aside and designed separately. Um, so in order to do that, we, we had to compare. Firstly, we, we checked the, the column, every, and this happened for every um, vertical separately, but we, we checked the vertical with a, with a standard code model. So we just put a pin uh, support here, and we, we looked at the secret factor, which is effectively the um, the factor of safety it has against buckling. Um, we then did a separate model with, with stubs, so generic stubs, which we adjusted until we got a, a similar or bigger C crit factor. Um, and then we looked at the, uh, the, the relevant stiffnesses. So th this here is the, is the stub we've, we've put into our model here. Uh, and then we've put in a separate model, applied the same horizontal load. So that's only for comparison, the, the load doesn't actually matter. Um, it's just a comparison of stiffness. Um, 
and we've modeled this time we've modeled the end plates the bolts um, and everything else in between so obviously as soon as you add in the end plates and the bolts it becomes much less stiff than the original straight through member so we had to stiffen this member by thickening the end plates or thickening um, the side plates or the box section or whatever it was in this instance until the deflection here matched or was less than the deflection here and then we knew we were at a point where our connection was stiff enough to be um, comparable to a, a standard code design model so <clears throat> that took an awful lot of um, I suppose consideration and, and design and research so um, it was something that while not necessarily it, did, it didn't jump out at, at first but it was something when we, we got into the detailed design that we certainly did have to tackle head on and uh, these were connections that we we uh, also included um, quite a lot of information on in our tender package because it was a little bit above and beyond maybe the, the standard connection that you'd have um, in a steel frame building. So once we had the stiffness sorted, we then um, we did a quick review of the structural properties and, and for moments and shears and, and, and the bolts themselves. So this is an extract of, of our final element software that we used for, for that process. And generally speaking, once the stiffness was satisfied, the strength was was well in because the um, stiffness was generally governing. Um, the um, j just in terms of then the, the the thermal properties of that connection was another uh, very important aspect. Um, and and just to mention actually, we we provided a full suite of of services, civil, structural, MEP, and sustainability on this. So our sustainability team. Um, went through a lot of um, design iterations of various stubs to see how the thermal aspects of the connection performed. Um, that was headed up by Paddy Field. So him and his team went through each individual stub. There were very, very uh, multiples of them and, and multiple iterations of them. And you can see here that the guys had um, the analysis software to see exactly how much insulation they needed, how the, the temperature um, changed as it went from external to internal, and always making sure that we had a case where we, we, we didn't have a condensation point, which is a, obviously a critical design factor. So um, just a, a picture on site then, this is uh, this was taken last week. So you can see they're, they're well progressed to the facade. Um, and you, you can see some of the, the, the typical stubs here, which are just about to get their facade plate on. They're passing through the, the facade there and you've, you've got your thermal break within them. And then uh, some of the, the heavier connections, you've got a, the diagonal or the splayed mega column as it comes up through and the facade line again that that requires a facade plate just to, to finish off the weathering and, and that will require some insulation inside to um to prevent the thermal ingress um so uh, just a final word then on the exotrust design um the the cords the top bottom and level eight cord and um, they're approximately 108 meters long so the building is 112 overall and they stop just short of, of each end and um, something we found very early on was that the thermal load case was critical in their design so we obviously with a 100 meter long truss we found that with the variation and fluctuation in in temperature it would it was unfeasible again to design it was starting to almost pull itself apart and um, so to overcome that we had to um we, we had to i suppose break up the the truss cords so that they weren't as continuous so what i've highlighted on the screen now are the structural external truss cords and um, all the other Horizontal members only are effectively um, placement uh, holders. They're, they're only for aesthetics, and we, we refer to them as the dummy members. So um, the the work for those areas is done by the internal edge beam. So effectively, the truss cord steps in and out, um, or inside and outside the facade line every two to three bays. So if we look at that in plan, um, you can see towards the top of the screen there, we've got... Um, the dummy member outside, so it's, it's not even shown on our structural drawing here, you can see. So you've got a, an internal truss cord. There's a significant um, structural piece of steel there to, to bring that um, true bending out to the outside. Uh, it's then external for two bays, internal for two bays, and it repeats that until it gets to the, to the far side. And you'll see that if anybody's on site or passing by, you'll see the bottom cords here you can see on the left hand side here you've got a very substantial um steel connection on the right hand side you've you've you, you won't be able to see that there's only a couple of bolts um with a, a sliding joint to, to prevent any um loading so it's when you look closely it's it's quite obvious that this is doing a lot less work than this and, and that is the case so um that was something that we had to consider i suppose early on or or we would have um we would have run into trouble with the final um design and, and the member sizes so um, 
the, the elliptical cores are the, are the next um, item. So they, they by themselves were quite a substantial structure. They were eight meters high um, and they housed two, two stories. They housed the, the foyers, back of house plant and, and the entrance lobbies. Um, so the, the concrete itself is, is an exposed concrete finish. Um, it's going to, it, as you can see there on site, it's, it's going to have a, an architectural fin put onto that. So the um, formwork and the tie bar holes and all that were, were very specifically set out by MCA um, to ensure that they were hidden by the by the final set out of the architectural fin. So there was a lot of work in that. They were um, formed on site with bespoke formwork. So they were all done um you know as and when they they went up with the with the elliptical cores so they they were they were quite a quite a difficult uh item for for bennett's it was it was very tricky and it had to be done correct first time because of the the aesthetic nature of it as well and um, to add to that complexity then as well we have a one of the primary structural columns um lands right here uh, and we had originally shown that column coming straight down um but during the design development and um, we wanted to open this space up to, to give a sort of a more impressive foyer entrance area. So that that there is effectively a four meter high curved concrete transfer beam. So that that was a, another tricky area of design. And um, and another another aspect that you might notice just we, we'll touch on it in a sec is the the diagonal steelwork here in, in the first floor. So that's put in to transfer some of the large horizontal forces which are sort of. Uh, uh, derived from the from the truss cord back into the core to provide its own stability. So if we jump here to the uh, an extract from our, from one of our first floor drawings, you can see you can see that diagonal steelwork on plan both sides. So that so that pushes um, that horizontally loads the the drum wall. Um, in order to take that force, it was, it was a quite a substantial set of forces. In order to take that, we we had to put in a, a concrete beam. So th this is a picture standing on mezzanine looking up at first floor um of the of the concrete beams which were put in uh, and that was obviously taken before the first floor slab was put in and as well as that you'll see that it's spanning over a rather large opening so we'll, we'll touch on that that's a ventilation uh, duct opening that we can touch on now in a sec um but you can see again nothing straightforward the there was quite a lot going on in the drum walls themselves and just point out there you can see that that's where the column lands down and you can see the the outline of the concrete uh, transfer beam there so again a, a lot of uh, a lot of force been transferred out there that's a, a 17 story column at the north end so uh, quite a collection load as well the um you'll see here on the left hand side then there's also a horizontal truss within buried within the floor plate um, and and that was that's a derived really from the sort of the structural action of the building so you can see we have the internal edge beams acting as the horizontal cord um, at that level um, but the vertical, or the, sorry, the diagonal member which picks up this um, cantilever here, that's still located out at this level. So you can imagine there's a there's a large um, tension force or pulling force on on the uh, on this member, and it's been propped just in board at each side. So that that induced a kind of a, a horizontal plane moment, and we found that um, it, we were struggling to get just standard beams to work, um, and we didn't want to rely on our metal deck. Um, was relatively shallow, so we didn't want to rely on that for any uh, particularly large um, horizontal forces. So the introduction of this horizontal truss helped us uh, greatly in that. The, the member sizes aren't overly big, but they uh, they stiffen that structure sufficiently that you'd um, that we were able to, to to keep them from moving. And you'll see, you might see that in some later pictures. You'll see various uh, horizontal trusses throughout the throughout the building. The um, we'll just jump back to the the overall cross section. So we had the. Uh, first floor trusses. So the, these were introduced just after planning. Originally, we had um, we had an 18 meter internal span uh, throughout, and look, we had to obviously find ways of of keeping it within budget and keeping it on on track. So one of the one of the efficiencies that we brought on at that stage was that we introduced the the first floor. Uh, transfer trusses that were obviously quite heavy in weight but when you looked at the impact they had on the upper floors which then could reduce to standard nine meter spans it was overall a much more efficient solution and generally speaking it, it, we had the addition of one column here uh, and one column there so it was, it was only for the addition of two columns um, in terms of the, the impact it had on the floor plate which was acceptable to, to the architect and um, so looking at that 
um, this is what it looked like as they were um, erecting it. And then this picture was taken last week um, just uh, as they're finishing it out. So you can see again, um, and you can see the, the mega columns here in, in the floor plate, both of which form very distinct features of the building now. So if, if uh, the, for the tenants on the first floor, that's going to be um, quite a dramatic uh, part of the building. And it's, it, it's um, I suppose it's, it's, it's great that you can see the, the very real structural parts of the building are, are kind of, they're not hidden, they're, they're very much exposed on this building, which is um, quite rare. So those two trusses were lifted in in two separate but single lifts, if that makes sense. So we have a, a very quick um, uh, time-lapse video here. So uh, I suppose the, the, the truss size, again, the trusses were approximately 30 tonnes in, in weight. So they, they, had, they were up there with the biggest lifts on the job. And um, they were about four and a half meters wide and 18 meters long or 18 and a half meters long. So they were just about at the limit of what could be transported. But um, I suppose it's an important lesson that often we we, um, we, we shy away from the, the large transports because of the, the difficulties and you need special logistics and special permits and so on. But certainly in this instance, um, it had a huge benefit. We didn't have to splice the truss. So aesthetically and structurally, it was much more efficient. Um, it was much easier, obviously, on site. You can see it's just been lifted in in a couple of hours there. Um, now, obviously, a lot of planning went into that, but uh, the physical time on site was much reduced. You didn't have to prop it uh, and splice it. So that was a, I suppose it was a, we were glad that we, we pushed for the for the large lift or the, and Chimla were on board with that as well. They, they brought it over on a ship from Italy and it was able to be brought to site by truck. Um, and then just a very brief slide on, uh, casting connections you can imagine there was there were, there were a huge amount of connections um which brought steel back to the concrete core so this is one of the larger ones we have up on level eight so it's a similar principle to what we just saw with the diagonal horizontal steel work at level one uh, where you've got quite a lot of horizontal force coming into the core and um, in this instance we have um orthogonal to the core and diagonal to the core so this is a plan sorry and um, and in order to get that to work, in order to get that sort of shear force back into the core, we have um, a rather substantial um, uh, cast in end plate. So you can see that that's all that can be seen of it on site. Um, but there's a significant portion of um, UC sections cast into the wall there to, to take that loading. So there was many, many different types of cast in plates. We don't have time really to, to look at any of them, any more of them here, but um, they're, they're varied in size and shape. And um, it was another facet of coordination that we needed to look at with Bennett's and with Jim Lai. So the temporary works, again, was was far and beyond what would be expected on a standard project. So it was something that we tackled very early on. It was something that we detailed out in our tender drawings to sort of flag to to, to Bennett's in the end that you know there was a substantial amount of steel work required in order to hold this building up in the temporary case until it became self-supporting. So in order to to build the, the exo truss, we had we, we you have thirteen grid lines, so you have twenty six towers um, uh, were, were erected, and you can see them in the forefront of the picture. There, it's the it's the brown and, and grey steel. Um, they all had their own <clears throat> pad foundation, sorry, pile caps and and pile foundations. So there was again substantial amount of groundworks involved in those. All those uh, in all, we had about five hundred tons of temporary uh, temporary steel work in, in, within the towers and, and the various other elements to support the the truss um, during construction. So uh, the, the towers themselves were were designed by Shimlai based on the loadings that we we had given them. So it, 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 in an actual fact, the the grey tower element here is actually a kind of a, a kit or a proprietary um, set of framing that Shimlai have um, for for just such the, uh, the occasion. Um, and then the brown steel work on top, the, the rustier stuff was was part of um, was bespoke and fabricated for um, the EXO. But um, yeah, look, a, a very good system. Um, they were designed as well for to be hydraulically lowered. So right at the top, they had a uh, they had a, a bracketry set up that they could install a, a a pump, a hydraulic pump, lift the building ever so slightly that they could slide out the, the, the props and then lower the building very gently. And, and that was essential because obviously we have 17 stories sitting on, on some of these towers and we, we couldn't have a situation where we're just, you know, knocking out a prop. We needed to have a very controlled manner um, and, and a lot of control over how that was depropped and um, when it came to that stage. So in terms of loading, then we had the maximum loading for for one of those temporary towers was about twenty four thousand kilonewtons, um, which which is a substantial load, and it's something that, uh, again, the scale of is difficult to see, 
Um, if you if you look here on the right hand side, you can see a close up of the towers. Um, you can see the construction workers down to the bottom left, so they're they're quite dwarfed by the the towers. And the, there's a a foot uh, member just on this tower here, and you can see in this photo the the guys are just trying to manhandle that in. So you, you know the the scale is 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 quite uh, quite substantial. Um, then in terms of the erection of the frame. Uh, the guys had had many um, ingenious sort of uh, nuances to, to how they went about their business. They had uh, this is just a, a picture of them erecting the northern um, floor plates on the tower block. So you can see that they've got the two cherry pickers. And um, they used a very clever. This was a sort of a something that Tusker brought to the table. I think they used a very clever system whereby they took the wheels off the the cherry picker and bolted them to. Uh, two steel beams and that allowed them they call them the deck deck riders and um, that, that allowed them to the flange of the uc sections that they bolted to was able to come down in between the, the ribs of the metal deck and that ensured that they were sitting always on a secure steel beam below rather than relying on the, the metal deck which was being erected around them as they as they sort of went so and um, what is inherently a very dangerous part of the build was was certainly made safer by by these systems i felt and then um, the you know they were very simple to use. The the guys were able to pick them up with the tower crane and move them around as as they went um from north to south with the with this frame erection. So, uh, look uh, very clever and uh, uh, something to uh, to look out for. Um, so the the next big item um on the list was was our M and E coordination. So, uh, a lot of that was done very early on and upfront so to speak. So generally speaking, the the a lot of the coordination is carried out uh, by the M&E contractors and, and again they did do that on, on this project certainly but um, at an early stage we needed to be able to give Shimalai builders work ops through the steel beams. The steel beams were, were approximately um, 700 mil deep <clears throat> and that was driven by the need to try keep the ceiling services or the ceiling void less than 800 mil and that's a, a fire regulation otherwise you, you get into void detection and void protection which could add a significant cost. Um, so we needed an awful lot of that depth, uh, especially where we were spanning up to 20 meters, we needed all of it. So we needed to then provide a passage for the M&E services. Um, so very early on, we, we coordinated with our, with our own M&E in-house um, and we effectively set out the size and location of every single opening. Um, and Shimalai took that and fabricated that. And that was done, I suppose, long before um, Jones um, Engineering came on board to to do the the M and E fit out. Now there was still plenty of of coordination to do, and there was a lot of development, obviously, in the interim between when we did the in house coordination and when Jones came on board. So there was a huge collaborative effort between ourselves, structurally M and E, Jones, and Bennett's to to make sure that the whole building fit together. And um, so I suppose that what we have on the screen is an extract from our Revit model, so you can see the level of um, coordination that was required. And this is a direct extract. It's the structural Revit model and the M&E uh, services model. We, we've just added a render to it for um, for the quality of, of presentation. But um, you can see again that you know there's a huge level of coordination where we're ducking under the shallower beams and through the the deeper beams and and you know uh, dog legging on plan in order to to get through various opes and and through uh, various different size ducting. So um, what that looks like on site then. Um, it manifests like so uh, and again you can see like you can see in the top left here you can the, the guys really did um, use every every single opening there were a couple of areas where there was openings left for future uh, tenant fit out so again there was a lot of considerations to be made for future fit outs which and, and, and future possibilities which you know you don't have full information on so obviously there was a, a look there was a very detailed present or uh, very detailed um, exercise happened with that, and uh, William Forsyth, I suppose, was um, the guy on uh, for us on, on the ME side who headed that coordination process up. Um, another area of of servicing that we needed to, to contend with was the ventilation, the extract and intake ventilation duct work was primarily housed in the existing part of the basement. So you can see that that's the frame of the glass box there. This is the existing three story basement. Um, and generally speaking, the eight story element of the building is all serviced from this basement and the, the tower block then is serviced from some AHUs on the roof. But in order to get from here to the south core, we needed to track uh, into the, the new basement, up the north core and at the soffit of first floor level all the way across to the south core. And 
that was a much more difficult, much harder um, done than said. Certainly, um, the size of the ductwork was was enormous, really, um, and we were hampered very much by the central core because the elliptical nature of the core, um, it was too wide to allow us to pass by uh, outside the core, but below the first floor soffit, and. Um, by passing through it, because we were approaching uh, an ellipse on plan with a rectangular duct, even if the duct was a metre and a half wide, you'd end up taking out maybe a three metre length of, of the elliptical wall just because of the, the logistics of it. So um, that's something we had to look at in detail. Um, and it looks like this on site. So you can see um, this is the central core and the south core. So you can see the, the width of the ducts, obviously, as you approach into the into the elliptical drum, you're, you're taking out an awful lot more wall than, than I suppose, the overall width of the um, the ductwork if you're approaching it from an orthogonal direction. Um, and look, that was a that was something that was, again, down to the last, uh, honestly, down to the last couple of millimetres to, to get that coordinated. And it's it was a big win for our client because it saved us having to, the only other alternative was to dig a, effectively a service trench or another basement um, to get from the north core to the south core. Um, so by by achieving that level of coordination and, and getting that across the line, it was certainly a, a big save for for the client. Um, the I suppose the uh, if if all of that wasn't um, complex enough, the, the the real complex part of the project was was the active alignment. And um, so to explain, um, we have it's clear you have um, a large overhang towards the north end and the south end of the site or the, of the building. Um, and what we found straight away was that we, we couldn't control the deflection to the level that we needed to. So if you considered that the mega column was our simple pin support for, for argument's sake, and um, we have effectively a 21 meter cantilever here and that deflects obviously under its own self weight and then with the applied loads that are, are put onto the building. So the primary source of the deflection is the elongation of the two main diagonals there, um, which uh, here and here. and you also have this translation effect. Obviously, you, not only are they deflecting, um, but the support point for the next diagonal is also deflecting. So if it deflects by 20 mil here, that translates to 40 mil here before this deflects or elongates by, by so much as a millimeter. So um, it, it very much, you know, a small deflection here could become a very large deflection at the tip. And um, so we had to very, very carefully consider that, um, particularly with the facade in mind. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got a full frame, uh, steel frame erected there with no facade. And, and that, that was precisely the reason because what in order to overcome that deflection, which was in the order of about 150 millimeters, um, we needed to come up with a way to, to take the dead load deflection out of the building. So we considered various different options, uh, pre-cambering the frame, uh, constructing the frame almost off square so that it would settle to um, where we wanted it to, but there, there was very little control over any of those options. So what we decided in the end was to effectively pre-stress the diagonals to the load equivalent to what they would have if they were simply the prop. So if you can imagine, um, we it, while the frame has been uh, erected, we have a support point under each uh, vertical member. Um, when you take away that support point, you induce a tension into the diagonal. So for argument's sake, say it was uh, 5,000 kilonewtons. So the idea was, well, if we pre-stress these by 5,000 kilonewtons, um, we should take the vast majority of the dead load deflection out. So when we take away the prop, there'll either be no deflection or very little. So that was the general principle. Um, and obviously that's a simplification. There was, a, there was an awful lot of modeling done and, and Mick and Paul did a, a huge amount of, of work on that. And we modeled it separately in house um, completely independently to, to see if our, I suppose, if our theory was correct. And then when Shimlai came on board, they had, um, look, Shimlai's technical expertise is, is, is second to none. They, they were able to do a, a standalone model as well to see how they're, because obviously they were going to be carrying out the active alignment and they were able to, to see what impact that had on, on their model. And so we had effectively a model done by completely independent people in Italy and in Dublin. And we got that to match up very, very closely um, in our theoretical models. And that gave us a lot of confidence then because this is certainly an unprecedented, um, uh, generally unprecedented activity to, to carry out on a building where effectively pulling the building together to avoid uh, deflection. So there is some precedence. Um, in principle, but not maybe it with the same application. I know the, the Leadenhall building in, in London used a similar process, but it wasn't quite as 
um, I suppose it wasn't a, to, to hang a building as such as to, to, to realign a building. Um, so what we did was we, we wanted to pre-stress um, the diagonals at each end of the building. So, so there was uh, six diagonals on each side of the building, 12 in total, uh, and they had to be pre-stressed in a very particular order in order to um, take away that dead load deflection. So that was done by, um, we can see here, you can see the diagonal, the diagonal is effectively placed in short. So you can see that the physical gap that we have there. Um, we have our <clears throat> clamps here, which clamp onto the, the flanges of each diagonal. And then we have our McAloy bars here, which are bolted into a hydraulic jack and they physically pull the two um, members together. So, um, you, you, and, uh, so as a close up here on the right hand side, you can see the, the many different clamps, um, which, which uh, by pure friction alone, uh, allow us to induce this pre-stress and that was an excellent innovation that Jim and I brought to the table it was um we had shown in our again this is all shown in our in our tender drawing so it was a, another aspect that we had to consider very early on to make sure it was priced but uh, an innovation that Jim and I brought to the table was that instead of um what we had shown on our tender drawings which was I suppose welded bracketry to house the pumps um, and and then they would jack the building together in much the same way using a, a McAuley bar instead of that they introduced this clamping um, principle. So that was of huge benefit because it meant that once the building was complete, you didn't have to effectively uh, grind off some plates or, or use any sort of heat treatment to get steel plates off the building, uh, off effectively what was a finished um, piece of steel work. Um, and while, look, admittedly, we were certainly um, dubious at first, Shimley, um had shown that they had done this before, particularly when it comes to launching steel bridges. So, you know, it's a similar principle, albeit a different application, uh, whereby they had a finished steelwork uh, deck, for example, and to launch that onto the to the supporting pylon, they would use these clamps to uh, connect onto a flange of the, of the bridge. And, you know, they would, they would transfer some considerable forces while they were launching the bridge, and then they could just unbolt them. And it's just a matter of painting the, the steelwork then. There's no... Uh, heavy uh, grinding or, or flame works. So what I've shown there on the screen is, is a cross section through the clamp. So your blue member is the diagonal and the, you can see the four McAuley rods, two on the top and two on the bottom. And then effectively you've got approximately, I think it's 48 clamps per, per diagonal. So it's an M36 bolt, which, which clamps between the outside and the inside face of the flange um, and, and gives you that friction um, uh, level that you need to induce the load. So to, in order to, <clears throat> In order to ensure that friction, you can see uh, the, the grey demarcation here. That's actually a, a friction grip paint, which Shimla applied to the to the relevant places of the flanges. Um, and you can see where it stops there. It becomes the, the standard blue paint. Uh, that helps to, I suppose, to guarantee or to ensure your, your friction coefficients. And it helps to align your theory, um, theoretical calculations with, with the on-site conditions. And to make sure you get that mating between the, uh, the clamping steel and the, the diagonal steel work. So overall, there was about 80 tons of steelwork within the clamps alone or within within these housings. So um, they, they were reused around the building. So we, we, we pre-stressed the, the four uh, diagonals on the south core first, um, and then we moved on to the north core at a later date when the, when the overall steel frame was finished. So they, they, they could be reused, but um, I'm sure they're, they're unlikely to be reused for anything else now. Um, in terms of the, the logistics of it, um, they, one of the... A very difficult part which again wasn't um uh, well you know occurred to me that wasn't uh, obvious straight away was the alignment of the diagonal so that had to be absolutely spot on before you induce such a, a large load so the guys used these slider plates to, to get their as a kind of a, a seating plate to get the uh, diagonals aligned but uh, they spent a long time uh, ensuring that those were absolutely aligned and that was that was essential because otherwise we could have induced um, large moments and it wouldn't take much moment within the McAuley bars to you know to, to get to their design limit um, long before maybe we've gotten to our pre-stress limit so um, once the pre-stressing was done to give you an idea of some of the numbers we had um, we experienced we, we had some of the larger diagonals were were well up in the in the larger uc section range so the largest diagonal we had was a 356406 uc 550 and um, so that would be certainly just just under the, the largest standard section you'd get and um, and that member 
the the gap between the two diagonals would have um reduced by 30 mils so we effectively got 15 mil elongation out of each um separate diagonal which is a a considerable uh, level of force and in order to do that we applied about 7000 kilonewtons of force uh, in the in the highest area and obviously those were fine tuned to the various diagonals that we were applying the forces to <clears throat> um so this um, photo here on the left hand side, I always find quite impressive, is, is the guys um, carrying out the, that's the, the day they carried out the physical alignment of the southern um, core. And you can see that as complex um, a, a, a process as that was, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, it was, it was a relatively straightforward um, pumping pack. So that, that's sort of the equivalent hydraulic pump that you'd have in, in post tension concrete as it happens. Um, and it was look. It was a real synergy between various different disciplines. You had uh, structural uh, considerations. You had uh, obviously the fabricator, how they how they went about it, how they were going to physically carry it out. Bennett's provided a lot of input, um, because there was uh, we, we needed to know an awful lot about the load that was on the building prior to the pre-stress. Um, so we were in touch with Bennett's daily in terms of how many services were installed. At what point were they at the fit out of the, the various different cores? They had to clear a lot of the floor plates during the active alignment, so there was a huge amount of coordination required there. And then obviously, um, you had Shimalize experts who, on the hydraulic side, um, were maybe not um, structural based, but certainly once we were, they were given the parameters by ourselves and Shimalai in terms of the stresses and the sequencing, they were um, extremely efficient at carrying out the, the physical pre stress. Um, in terms of how they they did it. Um, th these are <clears throat> they're rather small bottle jacks, so they're they're um, high high pressure, low travel bottle jacks. Four of them on on each diagonal, and you've got uh, two nuts on each one. So you've got one here in the back and one here within the body of the of the jack. So how that works? Uh, the jack um, uh, essentially expands between this washer, um, large as it may be, uh, between this washer and this washer with this nut keeping it in place. Uh, once it's reached its full travel distance, um, this nut here is screwed down onto this washer. So at that point, you can actually take off the jack and take off this washer um, because you, you've locked it in place. And that was another important consideration. We didn't want um, a, a situation whereby uh, hydraulic oil was, was holding um, the building in place. So we, we wanted that physical lock to ensure that we had control. Um, if, the, you know, if there was a, a problem with the jacking or a problem with the pumping, we, we, we weren't relying on it to, to hold the building up. Um, and then uh, that, that was repeated until the, the stressing was, was finished. Um, and then I suppose the, in, in, in terms of locking it up then, in the permanent case, we had um, <coughs> the guys had to go out and survey how far exactly, you know, obviously we had our, um, our theoretical numbers for, for the elongation. They were very close to the reality, but in, in order to get it uh, specific, we needed to go out and survey how far exactly they had crept together and then bespoke uh, end plate or splice plates were manufactured locally before they were installed so that they were bespoke to each different diagonal uh, depending on the, the level of pre-stress. So as I mentioned, um, sorry, just, just on the screen there, that, that's the active alignment kit um, on, the, on the southern two diagonals. So again, the scale is, is quite uh, substantially, if it's over, the, you know, it's probably six or seven meters in, in height there over the, over the full um, uh, height of the of the active alignment equipment. You've got four M76 McAloy bars doing the work for you between um, the two jacks and between, the, sorry, the two clamps. So, you know, it's it, it's a it, huge amount of, of loading had to be considered there and there was a lot of um, planning went into that before it was uh, successfully completed. And and just to give the, the guys on site some credit, the, the, this was all completed within one day for the South Core and uh, just I think it was just about a day for the North Core, even though they had double the number of diagonals. So, um, you know, a, a lot of preparation, but it was done very quickly once it was was put on site. Um, as I mentioned, then we, we needed a, a very clear picture of the loading of the building. So um, because we were effectively stressing the building and because we were depropping, not only were we stressing each end of the building, but by depropping the central parts of the building, we were expecting deflections, you know, in the order of 15, 20, 25 and 30 mil. So we were very adamant and uh, again it was captured within our tender documentation that we wanted the cladding to be held off until the depropping and active alignment was completed so um 
again, that's that was something that needed to be made clear to the to the contractor. That's not something you would expect, and that's why you have the the situation where you've got this seventeen story building with with no cladding effectively, and um, which is quite an unusual site. So, what's on the screen there is a a floor plan in order to, to mitigate against um, any uh, you know time uh, that it take took to install the facade. The guys had the facade stacked out on the floor plates. Um, from probably levels one to four as the active alignment was taking place and then they could um they could put more and more cladding on after the active alignment was finished and that suited us we wanted to get as much permanent load onto the building as possible and um, as close as possible to its final destination so you can see while the cladding is is internal slightly it's still very close to where it'll be put on the on the facade line here and the idea was that the more permanent load that was going to be on the building that we could include in our deflect in our active alignment um stresses it meant the less deflection would occur overall so um look uh, that, that again that was a very intricate um sort of sequence whereby we were looking uh, constantly at how bennett's were progressing on site we had to make some estimations because we were doing calculations for something that would happen in maybe six weeks time and, and obviously bennett's would have moved along in, in the meantime and um, and then i suppose to, to convey that to the Facade contractor um, who were Tivi Tech, um, you know, for for a facade contractor to, I suppose, grasp the, the fact that his support points might deflect is not usual um, for them. Usually, they're, they're, you know, obviously it's very common for your support points to remain still and, and for beams to deflect between, but we had to give a series of, of diagrams, which you can see at the bottom of the page, which outlined the deflection um, immediately after the propping which the facade contractor effectively considered tolerance because that was the shape of the building they would get when they arrived on site. And then secondly, we needed to tell them what sort of deflections to expect once their facade was on the building. So um, they could accommodate that within their movement joints and, and within their, their seals and so on. So um, they provided us with a, a unitized curtain walling system. And look, it turned out it was it was a very good system. It, it, it's managed to accommodate some large movements relative to a, a facade and it, look, it was it was a, a very um, uh, worked out very well. You can see uh, some of the later pictures now. They're, they're up towards level probably fourteen or fifteen with the facade. So in terms of the active alignment, the the all important numbers then. So what was uh, simply quite incredible, really. The the these are extracts from Shimlai's deflection reports and from the surveys that were carried out on site. So the grand total deflection for the south core was uh, actually zero mil. So when they finished the active alignment, um. And they had spliced the the diagonals up. They went down to re, um, to take out the the temporary propping, and they were able to physically slide the um the the last few shims out. So that we had put in by our large the, the exact right amount of um pre stress in order to keep that building hanging there. So we just about reduced the the load on the props to zero. So that was a that was an incredible um achievement from 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 a design construction and, and I suppose the uh, activity on site point of view so that look that gave us a lot of um confidence we that was the south core so we were moving on to the north core which again was more complex because we had we had more diagonals to consider and the net result of the north core then was um you can see down here was about four mil deflection at the tip and um, again which for a 21 meter cantilever over 17 stories is is absolutely um is incredible um so just a picture of the north core then on the left hand side you can see uh, a substantial amount of <clears throat> Uh, active alignment kit there as well up on the uh, 14th or 13th floor I think you've got the the cantilever scaffolding so quite daunting to you know to be working out on on something so high up and cantilevered out over the building and um, so yeah again look a great achievement from from the site crew and from Shimlai and from the design team just to to achieve that and it, it really it feeds in I suppose to the um to, to, the, to the kind of the sharp level line that the guys were looking for from an architectural point of view and um, a final word we're, we're getting close to the end now so final word just on on paint um paint was a, a very um a hot topic i suppose on on the project uh, we had a scenario where we had an a piece of structure which was external in one of the most corrosive environments you can have beside the sea and um, it also needed to have a fire rating um, and it needed to be very robust because it was uh, protecting some primary structure. So it couldn't it, it couldn't have a, the need for maintenance every you know couple of years. It needed to be a, a very long term solution. So, um, we I suppose at O'Connor Cronin we took on the responsibility of the 
the performance specification for the paintwork and it's something the Cormac at the time did a huge amount of um work on and and, and research on because it was you know it's a it's not something that we come across every day and um, you'll find when it when it gets to this level that there are only a few paint companies in the world that can supply you with a product uh, backed with the, the various guarantees and collateral warranties that are required for um, such an important aspect of the building. Um, so to give you an idea um, of the quantity, we have uh, approximately 30,000 square meters of painted surfaces, which to, to make that more relatable is about two and a half times the size of uh, the pitch in Croke Park or four times the size of the pitch in the Aviva. Um, so quite a substantial area to be covered with, with paint. And um, the the entire building was was fire engineered to uh, to to keep the the amount of uh, I suppose the DFTs of the intermessent paint to a, to a minimum. So that was something that was a a very involved exercise that Michael Slattery and his team carried out um, in in order to reduce the the the, the DFTs for the exotrust itself. And internally, we we went from uh, having a, a fire rated piece of steelwork everywhere to a much reduced area. Um, where by only uh, primary structure was was ninety minutes, and then it reduced to sixty or zero minutes, depending on where we were. Um, so um, that was that. That's the paint and, and an overall overview of the building. So we'll, I'll just leave everybody now with a, a couple of pictures of the project as it sits on site. So um, this is a picture looking up at the north elevation or the north cantilever. Sorry, and um, you can see that horizontal truss here just below. Um, it's before the foyer goes in, it, it really pronounces, I think, the, the cantilever, don't forget, we're, we're not supported until back here. So that's that's the length of the cantilever there. Um, the open plaza below, um, obviously the guys are still uh, paving that as we speak, but you can start to see it's clearing out. Um, and when the hoarding comes down, it'll be a, it'll be a fantastic space. Um, it'll be very open at ground floor level, and you're still accommodating that sort of 16,000 square meter building above. Um, Again, last week, uh, the guys pr uh, progressed with the facades, and again, you can sort of see the, you can appreciate the, the height and the, I suppose, the span of the cantilever at, at first floor level. Um, and then that's the picture we've been looking at throughout the, the, pro the presentation, just with, with the cladding on this time. Um, and uh, I suppose the, just to, to give it its scale, that's, uh, it actually looks like a CGI, this photo, but it's it's certainly not. Um, this was taken again last week. so. Um, you can see it's kind of how pronounced it is just um, outside Dublin's docks, which are here on the right. So again, we've got the plenty of OCSC projects actually in the in the frame. We've got the district centre to the north, um, obviously the EXO. We've got um, the Mason Hotel here just behind. We've got the Dublin Landings, which is a Ballymore job we've done, which take up takes up an, an, another full block. Um, we've got the Central Bank, which we, we were working on from the M&E point of view, and obviously the Convention Centre just behind. So we've got a uh, the North Docklands has been keeping us busy over the last uh, decade or so. Um, so um, I'll leave you with this photo, I suppose, just the, the Exo Truss um, overlooking its, I suppose, the inspiration in which it was taken from in the, in the Docklands cranes. Um, and, and leave you with some interesting numbers, I suppose. It's a 17-storey building, as we mentioned. It's 73 metres high, which will um, put it at the tallest office block in Ireland uh, when it opens early next year. Um, it was approximately 3,000 tonnes of steel for the EXO. Um, there were 3,800 or more shop and erection drawings submitted to us by Shimalai. Um, that doesn't include design submittals or revisions, so you can easily double that, and they all did have to be uh, reviewed and, and gone through, so a huge amount of work there. Um, there was about 37,000 steel members, so that they were effectively members that the um, frame erectors handled, and they were made up of about 51,000 steel parts. And then finally, you have 100,000 shear studs there, thereabouts, and 300, over 330,000 fastener pieces, which are made up of bolts and, and so on. So um, that's the presentation. Um, I have, Paul, if we have time, I have a two minute um, or a minute and a half um, uh, time lapse of the construction, if, if you think we have time for it. Yes, uh, uh, thanks very much, Seamus. If um, I could just ask people to put any questions um, in, in the chat, we take some questions after this. And um, so if you run this uh, video, we take some questions then, OK? Great, yeah. So this is a, an Evercam um, presentation. So, uh, th th you know, th this has been sort of taking a, a photo every couple of seconds for the last two years now at this stage. So you can see the, the demolition in the forefront of the picture and the reconstruction of the, the basement lid. Uh, you can see the construction of the, the north core basement. Um, and you can see that the, the, they've jumped the, the cores, they've flown up. 
um, and they, they went well ahead of the, the overall construction. Um, you can see the blue steel rock starting to arrive in place, um, as, it, as it frames its, its way up. Um, the, the main trusses are in and, and they start to follow themselves back up then and the mega columns starting to appear there on the north side. Um, it's quite quick, so it's hard to keep up. <laughs> You can see them jumping ahead with a sort of two to three story columns um, and then following on behind with the with the floor plates. And you can see again on the maybe if you look carefully, you can see all the service openings in the beams on the on the left hand screen there. Once they got to the tower, then, of course, things um, sped up uh, quite a lot. Um, so this delay then was kind of the active alignment. Um, so there was, I suppose it didn't look like there was much happening structure wise, but obviously that's when the active alignment was taking place in the preparation and, and the sign off, I suppose, and the, the checking of the frame. And you can see once once they were given the green light, the, the facade is really uh, flown on. So that's um, that's the EXO building. And, and look, I'll hand you back to Paul. Um, and any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to, to put them in. Well, well, first of all, um, Seamus, this is another reason why I'd rather we were uh, meeting in person because then you could see a, hopefully a big uh, roar or a cheer going up from the from the lecture hall for a for a wonderful um, lecture. Thank you, thank you very much. I did say at the start that I thought this building was striking, but actually there's a hell of a lot um, more to it than that. There's um, not just the complexity, but the simplicity that you've um, translated. Um, it in, in into the structural simplicity that you've you've uh, provided to it. So well done on that. We're going to take some um, some questions, um, and I have from. Um, let me see. Yeah. There's quite a lot of people on this um, call, so let me. I guess, there's a couple of questions in relation to. Robustness. Yeah, and it's a, it's an obvious uh, question. Let me see this. In Mikhail uh, Kowalski, could you please mention structural robustness, single element removal in relation to the mega columns and ties between them? Yes. Yeah, so look, um, it's it's a very good question. Um, the uh, and it's it, it formed a huge part of the design. We just ran out of uh, space for it. I suppose the. Uh, we we used all the different uh, we used the different types of um, uh, I suppose robustness um, design criteria that, that are available to us. So uh, it's a consequence class three building. Um, it's over fifteen stories. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's got a, an extremely um, a, a piece of structure which has an extreme consequence of failure, which is the definition in the code. Um, so what? What we did was, where, where possible, we, we used the, the key element, or sorry, the, the <clears throat> notional element removal. So that's obviously the preferred, um, the preferred approach because you don't have to consider loadings. You just look at what happens to the building as you remove different parts of it. So particularly on the northern elevation, or sorry, the northern uh, core, we have a, a secondary mechanism, I suppose, if there, if there was a, a failure to occur occur with any one of the diagonal members, which are kind of the, 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 the items that jump out at you, then we have a secondary mechanism. So if we lost this one, we still have one above. Um, that doesn't quite occur with the um, southern end. Um, if we lose one of these, we don't have a secondary mechanism. So what we did was we looked at these uh, as key elements. Um, one of the benefits of the... I suppose the building, uh, it, it's an office block which is designed for your, your sort of industry standard five kilonewtons per square meter. So one of the uh, parts of the, the disproportionate, or sorry, of the robustness um, is that it's an accidental load case. You've got a much reduced um, live load case and you're reducing your factors, obviously. So um, we did have a lot in the, in the bank, I suppose, in terms of the accidental load case because we had such a high live load on the building. 
Um, but we did have to consider that very carefully. And then for the mega columns themselves, they're absolutely certainly key elements, but the same remains true. You've got a, you're, you're holding up an enormous part of the building. Um, they're extremely robust. They're very, very strong. And they're also where they're most vulnerable at ground level for, I suppose, traffic impact or for, you know, it, for something to hit that hard enough to knock it down, it would, it would need to be a substantial load. And um, we have them surrounded and encapsulated within concrete. So we were able to justify it uh, using many different ways, designing as key elements, notional removal, um, and, and just the, it, it changed as we went around the building. So again, we did have to carry out a systematic uh, risk assessment in accordance with, with, with the requirements. So that, that actually highlighted quite a lot of different areas. We, instead of applying a single, uh, a single approach to the building, we actually highlighted the various different elements and went through them piece by piece to see how would we um, accommodate, say, a robustness requirement. Very good, excellent, excellent. Um, from Paul Murphy, we have a question. Um, on, could you outline briefly the structural scheme for overall lateral stability in the longitudinal direction? And and just for in case there's students here as well, just to you might just clarify in the transverse direction as well, just to yeah, absolutely. Re so re recap those, yeah. Yeah. So the um, I suppose the lateral stability is is dependent on the on the three concrete cores. So our uh, it's it's a good question. There's there's again uh, with this building, there's more to it than than meets the eye. So from a traditional sense, what we have is a concrete composite slab, and um, which acts compositely with the steel frame. That gives you a diaphragm, which brings any wind loading from the facade line back uh, horizontally to the cores, and the cores then cantilever up from the ground floor or from foundation level, and then that transfers the the horizontal load in both the longitudinal and transverse direction back down into the piles and into the ground. Um, I suppose something that wouldn't be as common is the, is the is the stability of the exotrust itself. So you can see here that we have um, we, we we have supported at level three slash level four all the way along. Now, if just by inherently looking at the at this, you can see that there'd be a tendency for the top of the truss to to want to to fall out, and um, and that's something that we found within our modelling was that there was significant tension forces sort of developing as we went higher up the building. So that's something that we had to consider very carefully as well. And we had to detail the connections um, appropriately. So even though you might have thought you just had a standard beam in bending, you would actually have a significant tension force in it too. Um, but going back to the original question, yes, um, in the in both the longitudinal and, and transverse direction, you have your diaphragm action of your slab brings back your horizontal loading to the cores and back to the ground. Great. Um... A question from Evan um, Orsmond, oh, uh, where the hydraulic jacks and the temporary works support um, the system ever used in the align with the alignment. Yeah, sorry. Where the heart, where the hydraulic jacks in the temporary work support system ever used to help with the alignment? Okay. I presume that refers to the to the hydraulic jacks that are mounted on the. Um, yeah. <clears throat> That were mounted on the temporary towers. So, um, there was a discussion. We did we did consider actually pre pre cambering a little um with those jacks because it was something that we had um we had the capability of doing. So, the answer I think is no. Um, we we ended up we we just we pre stressed as as I explained. But the for the areas and and, and funny, actually you should mention that where we had the biggest problem with deflection because of the active alignment, we ended up with zero. So the, the most onerous areas for deflection were actually within the central parts of the exotrust. So where they spanned traditionally between from core to core. <clears throat> so in those areas, the hydraulic props certainly were used because what we had to do was, um, we, we knew that they would deflect by sort of the 25 to 30 mil mark. And um, so we had maybe 50 or 60 mil of shims and packing between the top of the jack and the underside of the of the node point of the exo truss. And what we did then was we used the jack to lift that up just to take the load off the shims. And then you could take those shims out and let the jack <clears throat> gently reduce. Uh, and that was how we lowered the building or how we, we deep propped the building in a controlled manner. So um, in that sense, yes, they were used to uh, deep prop the building, but no, we, we didn't... Uh, specifically use them to, to help with the, the pre-stressing. But um, you can see why, why you might think that because yes, you do have a, 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 a an opportunity to apply a vertical force yeah. and you're trying to pull that together. So it's a, it's a good observation. 
Okay, very good. I'm just going to take a couple of more um, questions before we wrap up. I'm very conscious of the time. Um, one from uh, Thomas Griffin. From an insurer's point of view, was there a category three uh, check required by a third party? Yes, yeah, so we, we had several and um, we had multiple um, checks, including category trees. Um, I, I know um, way back at planning stage, we had one and um, we had several in-house ones, which I know aren't strictly a category three. And we also did it um, in, in our uh, some of our satellite offices, which are effectively independent offices. So, yes, we, we did carry out those checks and it was something that um, by the by this stage, we probably have we probably have four to five full peer reviews done by third parties um, of of varying backgrounds to ensure that the, the building is, is safe and, and and that it's it's designed in accordance with the with the relevant codes. Okay, very good. I think with 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 that, I'm just going to wrap up by using the chairman's prerogative and ask a question myself. And again, more directed maybe towards younger engineers who might be viewing this. I see from your your background and experience, you. You um you worked in uh, uh, did a bit of steel fabrication yourself, and then later on, uh, post graduation, you had the opportunity to work in New Zealand or in Australia, um on site um uh, with yeah. pre pre, pre uh, post tensioning operations. Do you think how much did that add to your um I I guess uh, to to your ability or competence that you felt on this or your confidence on this project? Can you just comment on that a bit? Yeah, certainly. So, look, I, I think it's I think it's imperative. Um, certainly for any anybody um studying in engineering, <clears throat> to to get on site in in any capacity is is a huge benefit. Um, I was very lucky. I had a, an opportunity to work with a fabricator for for many years in during my educational years. So, um, look, it, obviously <laughs> we didn't do things like this, but a, a lot of the principles are the same. You know, whether it's it's a building like this or a a smaller building or stainless steel or whatever it is, you, you know, you've got the same practical issues that you need to overcome. So um, it gives you a huge head start um, in, in standard and complex buildings. And then to, to work on site, to understand, you know, the, the conditions that the guys have to work to work in, you know, we can get very bogged down and, and very zoned in on the last millimeter or two millimeters or 10 millimeters. And then you go out on site and you're, you're 15 stories up in the howling wind and you have to appreciate the conditions that the guys physically work in so and mm. um, tolerance was a huge um discussion point on this project and you know uh that 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 did come back um several times that we had to, to look at it in detail and it was just understanding or having an appreciation for that and um, but no I, I couldn't recommend enough um whatever capacity you can get out onto site in be it uh, as a laborer as a, a site engineer, as whatever you can um, do it uh, if, if you're in engineering or in training to be an engineer, because it will do nothing but benefit you in the long term. OK, well, very good. Thanks for, for that. So so with that, I'm going to ask uh, Victoria Jansen to of Arup to uh, give <coughs> a formal uh, vote of thanks. And thereafter, we'll we'll be closing the meeting. Victoria. Okay. Thank you, Seamus. Um, I, it's very hard to do that presentation justice, and I, I'm impressed with the amount of material that you managed to uh, capture and uh, condense into an hour's presentation. Um, I think from the start, you obviously had a very complicated project, a challenging project, um, with a, a very complex site. Um, you know, from something uh, a challenge is as simple in inverted commas as accommodating um, the future extension to the Lewis Red Line. Um, to maintaining access for the three arena and the complexity around the sort of the site boundary compared to the red line boundary. Um, it's a, a building that is, I suppose, strikingly simple and strikingly complex at the same time. Um, and it looks like, you know, every individual structural element had its own unique design challenges. Um, and, I, you know, I can see weeks or months spent on looking at individual elements like the floor stubs, the column buckling um, the solving your thermal issues with the truss cords um, and the large um, openings in the cores. Uh, just numerous hours spent solving those things. And I'm sure there's been a lot of discussions with your um, third party reviewers on all of those elements as well. Um, and I think something that really stood out to me in the presentation was really the ingenuity behind um, the, the construction team um, and the approach that was taken to solving, um, constructing a very challenging um, building. Um, you obviously had a very, um, a very good team 
um, the, the contractor, the steel fabricator really all brought um, their brains to the table. Um, and seeing sort of the approaches to solving things like the, the tie beams at level four and um, the apparatus used for the active alignment, um, which again is, you know, an impressive design feat in itself. Um, something as simple as the spider cranes fixed down to the deck, which is another very clever solution. Um, and just the control of the, the propping. Um, and the the fact that you're able to achieve sort of less than five mil um, deflection after you um, unpropped um, um, the the trusses was really remarkable. So I think it's a, a building to be very proud of, and uh, it's a great addition to the Dublin skyline. So thanks, Seamus. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. And and with that, I'd like everyone to maybe offer their appreciation by if you can raise your hand. Um, we hopefully see a load of hands going up. That would be. Uh, that would be one way to, sh to show it again. I think if we were in, in person, there would be a, a big cheer going up, certainly um, from me. I would just read out, there's been loads of uh, complimentary uh, comments in the chat, and Victoria, we might be able to save, save these and pass them on to Seamus, but I'll just uh, read out uh, two. Uh, one, uh, Seamus, great presentation on behalf of all at O'Connor's Sudden uh, Cronin. Um, um, thank you for explaining so clearly the complexity and fantastic inf integration of the multidisciplinary team. Well done to all. It's Martin McGrath. And um, from Mary Rose O'Donnell, a great presentation. The Excel design team have been um, extremely lucky to have you leading the structural design. Well done. And I think that's very well said. I'd agreed wholeheartedly with that. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to just add, uh, announce that that we have um, and our next meeting is on the 8th of December. It's after our AGM. Um, everyone is welcome to the to the, uh, the the meeting, which is on the the Vision Control Tower at Dublin Airport, and and our will be uh, uh, presenting that. So another one to look forward to. I think we're very blessed with some great uh, projects and some great uh, presenters to keep us um, to keep us. Uh, constantly thinking and learning about uh, structural engineering. So with that, I'm going to close the meeting and say thank you all for your attendance. A thanks especially to, to Seamus and to v Victoria, also Orla Mannion of, of the committee who's done uh, great work in the in the background as always. So uh, with that, I, I bid you uh, farewell and good evening. Thank you. Thank you.